What's up guys, Jace Two Cents here and it's that time. I have spent the last uh, 21 or 22 hours, not straight, I did have a little bit of a break in between, benchmarking all these cards you see on the table because RTX is here. The embargo is finally lifting and now we can see firsthand why the secrecy regarding the reviews and why none of it was mentioned and what is taking so long for Nvidia to even acknowledge the whole gaming and uh, performance when it comes to rasterization. So we've got your answers guys, don't go anywhere. But first, we gotta pay some bills. MSI brings ultra-thin gaming to life with their new GS65 Stealth. The 4.9 millimeter bezel, 144 Hz, 1080p panel, Nvidia graphics and 8th gen Intel CPUs make the new GS65 Stealth a true powerhouse with a small footprint. Find out more and how to pre-order by following the link in the description below. Okay, so here we go, review time, guys. I'm, uh, it's been a while since I've done GP review. Actually, I feel a little rusty at this. Um, here's what we're gonna do. We are not going to take a deep dive into the architecture. Check out my friends over at Gamers Nexus, PC Per, PC World. These guys do excellent architecture discussion. You can learn way more than you'd ever learned from me on that. So we're gonna talk about what I think most people watching me are gonna care about, which is just the raw performance on Pascal versus Touring, and that's what we are gonna try and take a look at today. Now I'm gonna go ahead and get right to the slides, um, but I wanna talk to you guys about a couple things with the slides real quick. One, I tested a very consistent sampling of stuff I did with Pascal. So you're not gonna see a lot of new titles on there. You're not gonna see um, Battlefield 5, because that was in beta and the drivers weren't here yet for that. You're not gonna see Battlefield 1, you're not gonna see Battlefront 2 or, or any of that stuff because of the fact that I wanted to test different engines. So don't worry so much about the title that we used and the FPS that you're seeing worry more about the difference in performance between each card. Look at those differences. That's where your attention should be. Settings are gonna vary between different media outlets and different reviewers. Some people are gonna test on high. I tested everything on the highest settings. That's, I like to give you guys the worst case scenario. These are the lowest FPS you could probably expect. And as you dial back your settings, it will go up. So there's that. But we tested synthetics and then all the, obviously built-in benchmarks in a few different titles and the newest one being Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So with that, here are the slides and we've got a lot to talk about.
Okay, here we are. We are in Doom, and you know why I'm testing Doom? Because Nvidia said that they have really invested a lot of, of time and effort. Okay, here we are in Doom, and I'm gonna be maxing out these settings with nightmare mode and all that stuff because specifically Vulkan, and that's the reason why I'm doing this test, is Nvidia has always sort of lagged behind AMD in its Vulkan optimization and the open source API. But NVIDIA has said they have done amazing things with Vulkan. In fact, Vulkan is what they're using for RTX. So I wanna see how they're doing in Doom now. As you can see, we've got everything maxed out. We're using SMAA instead of Temporal AA or FXAA or SMA or TSA. We're just using SMAA. So let's just get right into the game. FPS is up here, I'll call it out. I know it's kind of hard to see. We are also running 4K. So let's see what we got here. So I'm right now seeing 130 FPS in 4K with all settings maxed. Now this isn't an So we are sitting in the 90s, the hundreds. It fluctuates a little bit, obviously depends on what's happening on the scene. But considering this is the 60 Hertz panel, it's obviously not having any problem running it. So Phil says he saw the FPS drop down as low as 70, but I then because I'm on a 60 Hertz panel, clearly I don't feel that. Oh, invulnerability. So, I mean, that's worth talking about. I mean, unless you have like a 120 hertz 4K panel, which does exist now, I don't notice any of the uh, FPS dipping. Now, my score dipped, obviously, versus my best, but, but whatever. So, that was perfectly playable. That was actually pretty amazing. Okay, so you guys saw that on Doom, the, the 4K performance in nightmare mode was pretty insane. Um, no, obviously the Vulc Vulcan API is amazing, which is why they're using it for ray tracing. But unfortunately we couldn't test any of that today because guess what? No titles today with the exception of a very limited demo of Final Fantasy that was sent by Nvidia, um, which we didn't test by the way, because I refused to use something not available to the public to do my testing. Because I want you guys to be able to load up your game and compare it to what you just saw right now. I don't want you to have to wait until something becomes available. Ray tracing isn't available and neither is DLSS. Two things these cards are boasted about and had an entire two hour keynote about with no gaming performance metrics mentioned whatsoever is something we can't even test the moment the cards became available. So there is that. But let's talk about uh, acoustics and cooling and then we will move on to my final thoughts. So the reason why I have the EVGA card sitting right here is this is a reference PCB. This is the same PCB that is inside the the founder's card right here. The only difference is obviously they implemented a much bigger cooler. And when we saw the dual fan design, I think a lot of us anticipated like, uh-oh, it's hot. That's why they finally stepped away from the blower style because the blower style cooler basically meant you could throw the card in any case. It didn't matter if it was small form factor or large form factor, ATX, whatever. The cooling would have been handled entirely on itself. It takes the air in and exhausts it out the back. It doesn't care about the case airflow being able to handle the cooling of the card. And it's one of the reasons why we test an open air test bench is because the only thing dictating the performance level of the cooler on this card is the cooler itself. So anything you see here is probably gonna be a few degrees hotter in a case, but that's why we don't test in a case because there's no case that accounts for everybody's situation out there. So we only use the cooler to determine the temperatures. But with the dual fans like this, typically they run much cooler and much quieter, which is why we see them in the AIBs. The problem is Nvidia really missed an opportunity here to make this an amazing product. Because if you take a look at the heatsink, it runs the full length of the card. The problem is it squishes down really tight right here where you only have, my guess would be three millimeters worth of opening between the, the shroud of the card and the actual heat sink where the air has to make it out because it pushes down and then has to come out the sides. There's no exhaust in the back, so none of that air can go sideways. The EVGA cards actually have holes in them. I don't know if you guys remember, they, they started this back with the ICX design. There's actually holes in the fins, so what doesn't make it out the sides can actually blow through long ways on the card too. But if you look at the bottom, it's the same thing. They could have left this open right here. And this could have, I mean, it doesn't get seen, it goes down in the motherboard. So they could have had a lot more air come out right here, but they didn't. And then it squishes down again on these parts, or it squishes down here, opens up in the front and the back underneath the fan. But this becomes completely blocked off by the motherboard. So the only air that can escape is out the top side of the card where the logo shows. But guess what? If you take a look at where the power pins are, dual eight pins, this is blocked off too, where you have a little bit of airflow in there, but now you've got this much percentage less airflow. So what we found was the temperatures on this card actually sat at least 75 degrees under load on the stock fan curve, 
And then when as high as 78 degrees, depending on the title, like 4K with uh, super sampling and all that on, testing the cooler, we could see that actually rise up to almost 80 degrees in an open air test bench. So unfortunately, a hit and a miss in my opinion in terms of the uh, actual functionality of this cooler. The reason why I said the EVGA card is here is because this card was anywhere between 10 to 15 C cooler at the same frequencies than the Founders Edition card because again, it's a 2.75 slot and more than, this is like triple the thickness of the heat sink that's actually in the Founders card and the fans are a much better design in terms of how much air it can actually move. And as you can see, it can breathe through all sides of the card. So now let's talk about some final thoughts here because we have over 300 points of data. Um, and fanboyisms aside, you can't lie with the data. The data is what it is. And the titles that we tested various different titles, obviously with different engines and, and different likes and dislikes in terms of what it wants in graphics cards. We saw great, great scaling with 3D Mark, but 3D Mark is designed to do that. I mean, this card just dominated in 3D Mark. The problem is 3D Mark is not realistic or indicative of what a gaming experience is like. It doesn't take, it doesn't really care about CPU overhead. It doesn't have to worry about game or player models and textures and all that sort of stuff that are constantly changing. It's on a track, it's perfect, it scales perfect. That's its one job. But once you throw this into games, like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Rise of the Tomb Raider, Metro, Far Cry 5, Hitman, it becomes a truly different story. Obviously 1080p becomes a bottleneck, even for our 8700K. So if you're running a high refresh rate 1080p, you better be overclocking the shit out of your CPU. We're running at 4.7 gigs, but 1440 and 1080p, we use 1080 Ti as our baseline to determine our performance per dollar and, and where you like kind of fall in terms of whether or not you're paying more money per dollar so or per, per performance. What I mean is if you got 15% more performance, but you paid 70% more dollars for that, I mean, obviously that, that would be a terrible financial choice, right? But that's what we kind of saw, 2080 trading blows with the 1080 Ti. That's exactly why we didn't see any performance metrics in their ray tracing or RTX keynote. I'm not even calling it the video card keynote. It was nothing but a ray tracing demo. And I think they know that if they had boasted about the 25% or 30% improvement that we saw, I think we saw up to like 31% improvement uh, with 2080 Ti versus 1080 Ti. The problem is it costs like 70% more money. So if you're getting 25% more performance for 70% more money, I mean, maybe there are people out there that can afford to just, you know, throw money at something and not care. I mean, that's why people drive Bugattis and Paganis because they got more money than they know what to do with. Um, it just doesn't make financial sense. And especially the 2080, which is the card I was hoping was gonna be kind of the hero card here. Okay, yeah, it's cheaper. It's still 800 bucks, but it's cheaper than a 10, 2080 Ti. And it, 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 I was hoping it was gonna mop the floor with the 1080 Ti, but the thing is it was anywhere from negative percentage performance. In some of our tests, it was getting beaten by the 1080 Ti. And I don't think it really went any higher than 9% faster than a 1080 Ti at $100 more. And we're talking $100 more than the custom 1080 Ti's, which are gonna perform even better than the Founders card that we tested, which means that performance gap will be even narrower or getting beaten by even more on the 1080 Ti and some of the tests were 1080 Ti won. So the 2080 became no longer a really compelling argument in terms of performance. 70% more money for some cases up to 30% more improvement. And what's disappointing about that is if you look at the family on family progression of Nvidia from around the 400 series forward, you typically got 25% improvement, 22 to 25 in my testing. I did a video about it, go and watch it, where at the same price point, the 80 series card, 480, 580, 680, 780, 980, and then Titan X Maxwell when I tested, we saw 22 to 25% improvement for the same price point. Titan X you know, excluded from all of that. The problem is now you're getting that same performance increase at 70% more cost. So I said in my previous video that they probably just slid the, the naming convention up one where the TI is now a Titan at Titan price and the 80 is now technically the TI. I was expecting to see quite honestly the 2080 at the $800 price point to be the 25% faster than the 1080 TI. And that wasn't the case. And that's why Nvidia didn't show any of their performance metrics. So until DLSS is out and matured and ray tracing is out and matured and developers have had time to develop for it, a new family of cards will probably be out anyway. So my current recommendation at this current time is a big fat don't buy. So there it is guys. Tell me what you guys thought. Conclusions are uh, 
my own, but I think a lot of people are gonna echo what I'm saying, or I'm pretty much just echoing what everyone else is saying, but I've been hands-on with it now for four days straight worth of testing and I'm done, sort of. Now I gotta overclock them and test it again, but it's depressing and I'm sad, I'm mad. Anyway, I'm gonna go guys. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Yo, NVIDIA, what the f man? And I'm done, 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 done.